The archaic style in Greek art flourished in the 6th century BC. Archaic Greek art comes before classical Greek art, which belongs to the 5th and 4th centuries BC. Most surviving examples of archaic art are found in sculptures and vase paintings. In the 6th century BC, Greek sculptors first produced life-size, freestanding human figures. The earliest were made of marble and limestone. These were displayed in public spaces, such as temples and cemeteries. Some of them are images of gods and goddesses. Others are of upper-class women and men. In the 20th century, the archaic female figure came to be called a kore. In ancient Greek, this is the word for young woman. The male figure is called a kouros, meaning young man. The women are clothed, the men nude. We will look at the female, the kore. These sculptures were painted, like the reconstruction on the right. Archaic sculptures, like classical ones, aim for naturalism and idealization. That is, they created art that was lifelike and beautiful according to their contemporary standards. We will look at three sculptures, comparing the treatment of their heads, bodies and clothing. This marble female figure was found in a cemetery at Keratia, just outside Athens. She was made early in the 6th century BC, possibly around 575 BC. In her right hand she holds a pomegranate, with a stalk pointing forward. The pomegranate is an attribute of the Greek goddess Persephone, the goddess of death, so some people identify her as Persephone but others believe she is an image of the deceased with an offering to Persephone. This figure is sometimes referred to as the Berlin Goddess or the Berlin Kore, simply because she belongs to a museum in Berlin. Let's start with the head. It is large in relation to the rest of the body, since it is about one-sixth the height of the body. The face is not intended to be a specific portrait. Rather, it is an idealized physical type which draws attention to the moral goodness of the woman. Beauty equals moral goodness. The face is U-shaped, with symmetrically placed features. Beauty is to be found in symmetry. Her eyes are large and almost semicircular, with the upper lids much more curved than the lower ones. The corners of her mouth turn upward. In turning up the corners of the mouth, the sculptor aims to convey some sort of expression which would suggest to us how lifelike this sculpture is. That is, she feels and thinks like a real human being, and she shows this in her face just as a real person does. Some scholars use the phrase archaic smile to describe the expression of her lips. It was probably less of a smile and more an expression of contentment, not at death, but in the knowledge of a life well lived. This is appropriate to the idea that the life of the person being commemorated should inspire those viewing the sculpture to live good and moral lives. She wears a kind of pillbox hat decorated with incised patterns. Her long hair, rendered in wavy grooves and ridges, is pushed back behind her ears and tied into a cylinder at the end. Like the face, the body and clothing are symmetrical. Only the arms are allowed to break the symmetry so that our attention is drawn to the pomegranate she is holding. Her left forearm, adorned with a bracelet, rests on a large wool stole whose symmetrical folds fall over her shoulders and chest, curving into an arch at the back. Under the stole she wears a long dress called a peplos. This wool garment reaches to the ground with regularly spaced pleats flanking a slightly wider central panel. In fact, the vertical ridges of her stole and dress make her resemble a column. The body is not visible under the clothing. She stands in a compact pose, with both arms held close to her body. She does not look as though she needs to change the position of her hands. Her feet are also in a stable position, close together and flat on the ground. This means they carry the weight of the body equally, 
thereby contributing to the figure's symmetry and stillness. Her decidedly frontal pose also contributes to the feeling of stillness. The head, shoulders, torso and legs all face in the same direction. We view the work best face to face. Since we are not encouraged to move around, we too are still and calm. As the century progressed, aesthetic standards changed and sculptors found ways of making their sculptures look more lifelike. This marble quarry dates to about 530 BC. It was found on the Acropolis in Athens. She is sometimes called the Peplos Kore, although she also wears a chiton under her belted peplos. Like the Berlin Kore, the Peplos Kore has symmetrically placed facial features. She too has the expressive archaic smile with the corners of her mouth curving upward. And she probably stood with both feet together and flat on the ground, so the weight of her body is carried equally. But the Peplos Kore is a bit more lifelike. Her head, for instance, is a bit smaller. It is about one-seventh the height of the figure. That is a more lifelike proportion than in the Berlin Kore, whose head is one-sixth of the height. Compared to the Berlin Kore on the left, the eyes of Peplos Kore are not as big in relation to the rest of her face. Her eyes are narrower and almond-shaped. That is, the upper and lower lids are almost equally curved. The treatment of her hair is symmetrical but not stiff. Some of her hair lies in six strands of curls, three on each side, on her chest. The curls look soft and flexible, almost like real hair. In the back, the hair is carved as one block of crinkly curls. Her right hand rests by her side and is attached to her upper leg, but the forearm of her other arm is brought forward. She may have held an offering. Once the arm is held away from the body like this, the figure takes up more space and is therefore less compact, less like a column. And with her arm held away from the body, she looks like she is about to change the way she holds it, since this raised position in real life cannot be held for too long. A transitory pose like this is one major step in making the figure look more lifelike. Her breasts are slightly visible underneath what is supposed to be three layers of fabric. But because the sculpture was painted, the ornate fabric took a lot of attention away from the body underneath. A later quarry from about 510 BC looks even more lifelike. She is on the right side. Her eyes are smaller than the earlier Peplos quarry on the left. Like the earlier Peplos Kore, she brings one arm forward in a transitory movement. She too may have held an offering. Her other arm is lowered, but unlike the immobile lowered arm of the Peplos Kore, this later Kore has gathered the lower part of her chiton into a big fold. This gesture pulls the fabric tightly around her lower body, so some of her body is visible underneath her clothing and this makes for a more lifelike appearance. Clothing is still important. Here, the sculptor offers a pleasing play of contrasting textures. The linen fabric above the hips, for instance, looks bulky, heavy, and crinkled. The same linen fabric below the hips looks flat, transparent, and clingy. The position of the legs and feet has slightly changed. The quarry places her left leg in front of the other, suggesting a greater sense of movement than if both feet were together. Both feet are, however, still flat on the ground and the weight of the body is evenly distributed. The 6th century BC interest in beautiful and lifelike human figures continued into the next century with classical Greek art. <laughs>